Okay, thanks. So, so this is a, a joint work with uh, Michael Ma. We're both computer scientists. So, uh, comments on this work from the law side would be very much appreciated. The uh, background uh, to, to what we're doing here is uh, the area of blockchain and smart contracts. So uh, just a very, very brief sort of description of what that's about. It's about taking systems which are uh, typically have been built in a highly centralized way and decentralizing the trust that we, we would usually place in some trusted third party by trust in a network of validators that are all cross-checking each other's work. And uh, from the point of view of what we're doing, the more interesting part uh, of this is the fact that the, uh, the information that uh, we care about the integrity of here consists of data plus code. Now that code is called smart contracts, although it's not quite like a legal contract, but it's being used to, uh, in various sorts of applications that are very much like things that matter to the law. So things like currency, uh, fundraising, so we've had the phenomenon of initial coin offerings and utility tokens, decentralized autonomous organizations, which are company-like structures on the blockchain, and more recently, non-fungible tokens. Now, a lot of this activity has been happening in the uh, in a bit of a sort of wild west sort of scenario, and regulators have stepped in and said, no, 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 you can't do these things just on the blockchain. You've got to do them in a legally compliant way. So what's becoming more interesting these days is to have uh, regulated and legally compliant crypto tokens, uh, which typically involves backing those tokens by some form of legal contracts. We're starting to see the emergence of, of the uh, area of smart legal contracts, which combine a smart contract with a legal contract. So uh, our broader research program uh, encompasses issues like um, well, first we'd like to understand what issues arise when you're implementing a legal contract as a smart contract and uh, how the two related. But uh, for us as computer scientists, the interesting questions are things like uh, what smart language, smart contract language support is beneficial for these sorts of applications and what sorts of verification issues arise for these smart contracts that deal, for example, with uh, some of the hacks that we've had where large amounts of money have been lost. So um, towards this end, we've done a case study of safe contracts, which are a type of venture financing contract that was invented by Y Combinator, which is a Silicon Valley incubator. So it's the, the simple agreement for future equity. And I'll explain shortly what that is. Um, in the context of doing this work, there's already several, already several papers that have come out of this project. Uh, I'm going to focus uh, in this presentation on the first two, if there may be some questions at the end. I've got some extra slides to talk about the, the game theoretic questions. So uh, we've needed to clarify what the contract is all about and how it operates in practice, and then get into issues like how do we formalize the legal text of the contract, how do we architect the, the application, and what are the surrounding legal issues uh, for this particular type of smart contract application. So to begin to understand what the contract is about, here's the typical life cycle of a startup company. So it's, it's formed, it gets some seed funding. Uh, as it grows, it may take larger amounts of funding from venture capitalists, and ultimately it may be successful and go to an initial public offering in the public markets. Although, of course, along the way, the company could always fail or uh, be acquired by some larger entity. The safe contracts are used primarily at the stage of seed financing. So it's usually the angels, uh, angel investors that are uh, involved in these sorts of contracts. And they've been designed to solve a particular problem, which is how do you value a very early stage startup in order to determine how many shares the investor is going to get for their investment in the company at that very early stage. And the safe contract solves this problem by saying, okay, well, let's kick that, let's kick the can down the road uh, and uh, issue a contract that doesn't require a valuation at this very early stage. But uh, at some later time in the life cycle of the project, when the company goes to a venture capitalist and they do a carefully constructed priced equity round with a pre-money valuation uh, determined by negotiation with the venture capitalist, at that point, the safe contract will convert into a shareholding in the context of that priced equity round. Okay, so uh, that, that also saves the safe investor all the complexity of the, uh, the legal costs 
and negotiation costs around uh, uh, negotiating a, 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 an investment for shares. So the safe contract uh, has clauses that deal with a number of different types of events that correspond to the life cycle of the company. So there can be an equity financing and this uh, description of what happens in that case. But there could also be what's called a liquidity event, which is a change of control, like a buyout or an initial public offering. Or the company could just be terminated, and that's a dissolution event. And some clauses in the contract that describe that. Okay, so now in setting up to do smart contracts for these type of contracts, there's, there's various sorts of challenges. So let's have a look through those. First of all, um, there's multiple variants of these safe contracts. Why Combinator in its initial release of these contracts already gave four versions with some parameters called the, the cap and the discount and different combinations of whether you have those already give you four different contracts. Um, uh, and then uh, moreover, uh, more recently in 2018, uh, Y Combinator has, has modified its safe contracts to work on not the pre-money valuation of the equity round, but a post-money valuation uh, of the equity round. Uh, so, so that already makes eight different types of contracts, but other uh, incubators, other investors have uh, gone off and made lots of other modifications. So that's, that's a bit of complexity to, to be dealt with. Um, to give you a feel for how the contract looks, there's some text from the, context, from the contract around the equity financing clause. Uh, and uh, rather than try to, uh, to read all this text, let me give you a sort of capsule description of, uh, of a sort of simplified version uh, of this text uh, in terms of some, some, some equations. So essentially what the equity financing clause says, ignoring some complexities, is that if the pre-money valuation of a company is less than or equal to CAP, which is one of the parameters of the contract, then the number of shares issued to the safe investor is going to be equal to the money that the safe investor invested divided by the price of the shares that are being paid by the venture capitalist. Okay, now the effect of this clause is essentially to give the uh, safe investor downside protection. If the company hasn't done all that well, then the, uh, the essence of this clause is to, is to say that the safe investor is going to get uh, a, a number of shares that corresponds to uh, in value to the money that they invested. However, if the company has done very well, then the uh, safe investor gets some upside. Uh, and uh, if the pre-money valuation is greater than the cap, then the number of share, safe shares is equal to the money that the safe investor invested divided by the, uh, a safe price, which is uh, giving the, that investor a discount on the price that the venture capitalist is paying. So it's calculated using this formula. Okay, well, that law looks simple enough. But if you start to think about uh, what is this really doing uh, in terms of uh, is it sensible to invest such a contract and do some financial analysis of it as we needed to do in order to really understand these contracts and you look at the way that these contracts actually work in practice, then you start to see that there's reasons for some complexities. So. Uh, in a usual equity round, the share price is calculated just as the pre-money valuation divided by the number of pre-money shares. Uh, and you get the, the uh, number of shares after the equity round is the number of shares before the equity round plus the number of new shares that are issued to the venture capitalist. When there's safes uh, in the mix that have been issued by the company, then the number of post-money shares uh, includes not just the previous amount, but also the sh new shares that are issued in conversion of the safe contracts. And the effect of that is to immediately dilute the new investor so that they're getting shares of value that are less than the amount of money that they've just used to buy those shares. Now, that's obviously undesirable for the new investor. So, um, this raises some questions, right? Well, what, just what is the meaning of this term pre-money valuation? And if you start to think about that from an accounting board point of view, there's two ways to do the accounting in relation to these safe contracts. You can view the safe contracts as being a liability of the company, 
Okay, in this case, the pre-money valuation is equal to the uh, usual assets minus the usual liabilities minus the value of the safe contracts. Or you can view the safe contracts as being represented on the cap table of the company. In this case, the pre-money valuation is just the assets minus the liabilities as usual. Okay, now Y Combinator actually says that safes are not liabilities for reasons relating to US tax law. But uh, it turns out that when you do the calculations that the... Um, the equity round equations actually make a lot more sense for the venture capitalist investor uh, in the case of the, uh, the, the, the liability view. So uh, a rational response by, this, uh, by the new investor, by the venture capitalist to this dilution is to uh, decrease the pre-money valuation that they give to the company so as to ensure that their post-money share value is equal to the new money. So, Effectively, that amounts to saying that, well, we're going to use a different pre-money valuation. That's our original pre-money valuation minus the value of the safe instruments. Okay, And in response to that, the safe investor may say, well, look, but that's not the deal that I signed for the safe contract. So you can't use that pre-money valuation that's being used by the venture capitalist to, to, to execute my contract. And so they have a dispute here between the new investor and the safe investor. And there's a compromise that's sometimes used in practice called the dollars invested method, where uh, we use a pre-money valuation that's the, uh, the usual pre-money valuation minus the amount of money that's uh, invested by the safe investor. Uh, and um, that's still a dilution, but it's a sort of compromise, not as bad for the venture capitalist as the, uh, as the other approach. So, now, principle, this is a contract and the parties can negotiate as to how they're going to deal with disputes about that contract and just settle that way. Uh, so that raises a question for, well, what do we do to implement this in a smart contract? And our decision has been to say, okay, well, there are these complexities and we're going to leave those out of the smart contract uh, and uh, leave those to be handled using off-chain processes. There's uh, a further complexity, which is that the, um, the safes actually introduce a circularity into the whole story, because the, the, what, if you think about uh, what is the value of the, uh, the safe contracts, well, that depends on how many shares the safe investors are going to be issued. And that, in turn, going back to the equations that I had, depends on the pre-money valuation. So that's a circular definition, it looks like. Uh, you can make sense of it just by writing it out as some conditional equations and then solving those equations. Okay, And in fact, the, the post-money safes do something that is effectively like that. They don't really state directly uh, a, set, a, set, a formula that's used for calculating the number of safe shares, but rather they state a set of simultaneous equations that uh, need to be solved in order to compute the share issuance to the safe investor. So the, uh, this paper here talks about all of these details and goes into some game theory questions uh, relating to, to these issues. Okay, so now that we've sort of understood some things about the contract, let's, let's go to, uh, to the full job of uh, encoding the legal contract as a piece of computer program. Uh, and we hit here uh, issues that have been well known in the area for a long time uh, and have been discussed numerous times already at this meeting, a question of open textured terms in legal text. And uh, although what we're dealing with is a very sort of fairly rigorous financial area of, of contract, uh, there's still open texture in the language uh, of the safe contract. So just the definition of equity financing, for example, contains at least three terms that you might consider to, to be open textures, like the bona fide series of transactions, or what transactions count to be part of that series, and principal purpose of raising capital, what does that mean? Moreover, there's a difficulty of the open-endedness of the whole scenario that we're trying to model. There's already these eight different forms of safe contract and others are possible. Uh, we don't know at the time that we're writing the safe smart contract what the rules around the preferred shares are going to be. 
That's decided by negotiation with the venture capitalist. Uh, and then after the equity round, the company is also going to have some new board structures or some new controls around the company. And we don't know in advance what those are going to be. So how do we include that in our modeling? So um, let, let's go through some ways that we've chosen to, to deal with some of these difficulties. Well, first of all, let's note that uh, our situation is a little bit different from uh, what you usually have when you're trying to formalize legislation and uh, do things like legal expert systems, which is supposed to work for a large community of users. We're doing a smart contract here, but it's, uh, it's enough for it to be good for the parties to the contract. Uh, and in fact, we can design that contract in such a way that it doesn't need to be able to interpret these terms in uh, all the, the possible uh, fact scenarios, but rather the contract itself can limit the fact scenarios that it needs to deal with in its interpretation of its terms. So an example of this in our uh, setting is that uh, while there's preferred shares, uh, and the equity financing clause talks about preferred shares, but which issuances of preferred shares are part of a particular equity round? Well, we can finesse that by saying, okay, the smart contract is going to be constructed in such a way that um, while the safes are unconverted, the only way that the company can do an issuance of preferred shares is by running a specific equity round operation. So we make sure that that preferred share issuance is going to be part of that equity round. So that's not a question that we need to answer. Uh, for uh, the indefinite and open texture terms more generally, we've chosen that the, uh, the, the best way to deal with this is just to allow flexibility at a per contract level. So the parties can either agree to use a particular formalization of the term, or they can agree to a formalization of the process that's going to be used to decide whether the term applies at the time that the question actually arises during the running of the contract. Okay, so this can be either be a sort of proposal by the company for, uh, and, and an approval by the investor, or we can rely upon some trusted third party to do things like uh, give a valuation of the company for use in the pre-money valuation calculations. Uh, there's the issue of incompleteness and in the fact that the post-money safes are just states and constraints. Uh, so uh, to deal with this, what we've done is to say rather than calculate a, uh, the number of shares that are going to be issued to the safe investor when the contract converts uh, and, and do that as part of the smart contract. Instead, what we'll do is that the company is going to uh, send a transaction to the smart contract that proposes the structure of an equity round. And then the smart contract is going to verify that that proposal satisfies the set of constraints that are being stated in the contract itself. So we can handle here the constraint-based nature of the post-money safe, uh, as well as the, uh, the calculation within the, the, the pre-money safe. Okay, that has also the benefit that the, uh, the blockchains uh, are limited in the amount of computation that you can do inside of a smart contract. Uh, so very high complexity computations uh, you don't want to do, and constraint solving might be undecidable. So we've pushed all of that complexity off chain in the way that we've decided to, to implement the thing. So here's some diagrams giving the uh, structure of the implementation of the smart contract. So we've done the implementation on Ethereum in the Solidity smart contract programming language, which is an object oriented programming language. So the, the boxes here correspond to various objects that uh, occur within our design. So we've got uh, a type of object that is representing the company, and in particular, the cap table of the company is represented here. Uh, but then um, we've used the sort of proxy controller pattern, uh, where uh, if, there's, uh, if the company wants to do any operation on its cap table, then it needs to do so via the safe controller, which is a, a type of smart contract that knows about uh, the safe contracts that have been issued, and these are represented using a, another type of smart contract. And what the safe controller does is it takes a request of uh, an action to be performed on the company, and it sends it over to all the safe contracts and asks, is that action permitted according to the terms of the contract? And the contract will then respond, so the safe contracts will then respond yes or no. If all the responses are yes, 
then the action will actually then be applied on the company. So here we're uh, enforcing that the, the safe contracts are going to be complied with. Uh, and this allows us to, to write the code for the safe contracts in a relatively declarative way. The uh, equity round uh, I've talked about, so the, is done using a proposal of the terms of the equity round. So that's things like the company valuation, the price of the shares, uh, the number of shares issued to each of the safe investors and, and to the new investors, and what is the, uh, the post equity round control structure on the, on the company and a deadline for completion of the equity round. So, so if that's approved by all the safe contracts, uh, then uh, the safe controller will actually create uh, an atomic swap contract. This is used to make sure that um, uh, when the investors pay in their money, they actually are guaranteed to get shares uh, for, 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 uh, for the, uh, the money that they're putting in according to the terms uh, of the, uh, the equity round. Uh, and uh, if this all goes well, then uh, the, uh, the equity round swap guarantees that the, the safes will convert and issues the, uh, the shares uh, to the safe and to the new investors. And after the equity round, we're left with this uh, architecture for the whole system where the company is now controlled by a new post round controller, the address of which was provided. Uh, in the, uh, the the call to to set up the the equity round. Okay, so that deals with the fact that we can't predict in advance uh, what the equity round uh, post equity round control structure of the company is going to be. Okay, well, so let's now think about uh, having done that particular translation of the the contract into smart contract code, let's think about how we can evaluate the adequacy of what we've just done. And there's an inherent problem that we face here, which is that we started out with some relatively informal legal text with all these open text concepts in it in particular, and we've written some formal smart contract code. And uh, they're just two completely different types of things and we can't use something like formal methods, which is a, a sort of mathematical verification method used in computer science in order to prove the equivalence of these two things to show that it's a completely and absolutely correct uh, representation of the legal text in the smart contract. So, so what's available to us? Well, we can get some experts to, to, to look at the smart contract code and say, is that a good implementation of the legal contract? But the difficulty with that is going to be that uh, who can read both code and legal text and be expert in both? There's very, very few people in the world that have that expertise. So um, what you're more likely to be able to do is to do testing based on some concrete test scenarios. Uh, and uh, you might ask, well, where do those test scenarios come from? And case law might be something that comes to mind here. So we went looking for some case law around safe contracts. And the problem is that they're very rarely litigated. Uh, and uh, most of the cases that we found, in fact, hinge on matters that are not relevant to actual interpretation of terms in the contract that are more around issues like, was there a, a contract issued at all uh, in these cases, which we're dealing with legal contracts, not with uh, smart contracts, of course. Um, so uh, we're essentially down to, to having to rely upon uh, test scenarios that are provided by some experts, so we think that's feasible. Uh, or uh, we can field the smart contract and then get error reports after deployment. Although uh, you need to take into account here that any error report you get about your smart contract might actually be a question uh, of legal dispute rather than uh, an error in the actual contract. And uh, to look a little further into evaluation, um, one of the questions you might ask is, okay, uh, is the smart contract doing everything that the legal contract was doing? Does it provide you with all the protections that the legal contract was providing in particular? And the answer to that question turns out, uh, at least for the way that we've done things here, to be no, if you just re rely upon only the smart contract. There's an attack, uh, this, this works even against uh, a legal safe contract uh, in which essentially the, the company and the, the venture capitalists collude against the interests of the 
safe investors. And uh, what they do in that collusion is to structure the venture capitalist money across two equity rounds at different prices rather than do the investment in a single equity round. Okay, so there's an example of this here. And uh, the, I mean, I won't go through all the details of this, but the, the net effect of uh, this structuring the, uh, so the new investor has some amount of money to invest, uh, 1500 in this case, and that's going to be um, uh, broken up into two equity rounds, the first of uh, $1,000 and the, the, the second of $500, okay, a different uh, valuation, so different resulting prices. And the net effect in terms of the outcome on the shareholdings of each of the parties, the founders, the safe investors, and the, the new investor is uh, a significant difference in doing it in a single round at an honest valuation and structuring the transactions across two rounds at dishonest valuation. So you see here the safe investor in this case gets 69% of the company. In this case, they're getting 0.7% of the company. This is of course a very dramatic example, but it illustrates the type of thing that, uh, that can happen. Okay, so how do you defend safe smart contracts uh, against this type of attack? Um, uh, in fact, the, the legal safe has got some text in it that does provide a defense uh, against uh, this attack. So equity financing, remember, was defined as a bona fide transaction or series of transactions, okay? And you might argue that structuring the equity round into two rounds like this well, that's a series of transactions. And from the legal point of view, uh, you might take the attitude that, okay, well, that series of transactions really ought to be considered as one transaction. It was not bona fide and the price was, was not a, uh, based on a reasonable valuation of the company. So the legal text is defending against this type of attack. So um, to, to get the smart contract to, to have that defense, we think that the most appropriate response is to say, well, the smart contract is going to be combined with a legal contract that covers these sorts of terms. Okay, so what we really do need, uh, I mean, there's, there's a view in the field of, uh, of, of blockchain smart contracts that the, uh, the, the code is the law, um, but uh, really we see here there's, there's, there's reasons to have a legal contract as well as a smart contract. So uh, what should the text of the legal contract that we associate to the smart contract say besides things like this? Uh, well, um, um, and here we're, we're not lawyers, so, so we haven't done a sort of, tried to do a complete job of this, but here is just a list of a few of the things that we think uh, are necessary in a legal contract that should accompany the smart contract in order to, to cover all the bases and to, to, to make sure that the, what the smart contract is gonna be doing is going to be considered valid and defensible in the law. Uh, so it's things like the, the, the company should make sure that uh, what's in the smart contract is a complete and correct record of the state of the company's cap table. Uh, it should uh, do whatever it needs to do to ensure that uh, that representation will be considered to be a valid representation within its own jurisdiction. Um, it, the company has an obligation to do its equity financing on the blockchain, seeing as that's what's the re representation that we're using. Uh, and in a situation where the state of the smart contract correctly represents the cap table of the company. Um, and there's other conditions like uh, the, the investor may need to do things like uh, submit various types of transactions onto the blockchain for uh, things like doing approvals. Uh, of things that they have rights to approve. Uh, so there's some text that uh, describes what the obligations are of the in, uh, investor. And then we might have some um, clauses that talk about dispute resolution. Okay, there's other issues. Um, I'm just gonna skip over these in order to get to uh, my conclusions. So um, in conclusion, then, uh, I mean, this was a fairly intensive exercise. It's already produced three papers, uh, and I think there's more yet to be done. Uh, and what we would say is that the work of developing a smart contract can actually force a focus on uh, the following sorts of questions. What's the interpretation 
of the terms in the contract. Um, are there any gaps in the contract? Can we fill those gaps? Uh, where there's indefinite uh, or open text concepts, do they serve a legal purpose? Okay. Uh, and um, well, I mean, this is, relates more to, to the game theoretic work that we've done. Uh, we'd like to be able to reason about the behavior of the contract under all event sequences and make sure that uh, uh, there's no uh, game theoretic situations that arise that have inherent conflicts. Now, all of this type of analysis uh, is, is hard work, uh, but we think it can actually, doing this work can actually drive making improvements in the contract itself. And uh, although you might not want to do that for just bespoke contracts, uh, it's quite valuable and worthwhile to do in the case of industry standard contracts, uh, where it really makes sense to have an industry standard that's been very deeply analyzed uh, and so, so we think it's worthwhile doing this for, uh, for other things and we're quite interested to hear uh, what other types of contracts uh, you uh, might think fit within this category of, uh, of industry standards. Okay, so I'll, I'll wrap up there and take questions. Thank you, Professor Nathan. I think um, Jason has a number of comments that he's made in the chat. Uh, Jason, uh -huh. do you mind if I ask you to maybe say something or two about presentation? Since, you know, maybe in summary. Well, yeah, um, my question would be, um, and I will preface by saying that I have some um, strongly held and unpopular views on this front. But um, do you think that um, if you have a company that has a legal personification that has been granted by a government, that it still makes sense to be implementing smart contracts in a trustless way? Don't we implicitly trust the government? And if we do, why don't we just automate our contracts with the help of the government instead of using blockchain. So m another question is like, if we trust the government to issue corporate certificates and we trust judges to adjudicate contracts fairly, then why can we not find someone to trust so as to avoid needing to use blockchain at all? Why don't we automate contracts without it? Um. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a, uh, I mean, I think there is, uh, I mean, as, as we see for um, a, a lot of the uh, activity in the general space, there, there's a, there certainly is an appetite uh, by people to have these digitally represented assets um, uh, and to, to be able to do things like sort of 24-7 uh, trading. Um, uh, um, in, in, the term, in, in case of, uh, I mean, the, the safe contracts are used by startups. Uh, and uh, the way that a startup typically represents its cap table might be on scraps of paper or just an Excel spreadsheet. So there's, there's questions around the integrity of the representation that a blockchain system might, in a very efficient way, solve. Now, there are, there, there are corporate sort of registries um, that, uh, that record shareholdings, uh, but they're, uh, I think, quite expensive for a startup company. So, so that might sort of, um, uh, I, mean, I think ultimately it's going to be a question of um, what does the market want here? Um, uh, this for us was an exercise. Our, our real interest uh, is in smart contract programming languages and verification techniques, but we're interested in domain specific languages for these the sorts of applications that people uh, are pursuing in this space. And I think this, this safe contract, there are things like decentralized autonomous organizations is a similar one, um, which basically it's sort of company structure represented on the blockchain. Uh, so uh, there's, there's definitely interest. Uh, so, so what we're there's, most there's interested in- There's interest in NFTs too, but I don't think that makes any sense either. The, with regard to the DAOs, I have the exact same concern. I, I saw a thing released on distributed autonomous organizations where you can set one up and it will automatically register it as a company in, in Delaware. Mm -hmm. uh, which to me just, I, I, I cannot fathom why people think that a, a distributed trustless method of computing 
is going to be useful if you are relying on a trusted governmental authority to underlie the usefulness of the structure at all. It, it just seems completely nonsensical to me. But I, I will also say, with regard to it, the efficiency, I think blockchain is computationally less efficient than centralized approaches. The having, having to have all of the nodes in the network double checking everyone's work and the enormous amount of electricity that's spent on doing the calculations required in order to do that in a trustless way, all of that is wasted if you actually do trust someone. So yeah, that seems that, that's, and, and, and that to this area is, is, is one of the main concerns. There's a trade-off between efficiency and integrity. Uh, and uh, blockchain systems are opting to have more integrity at the cost of efficiency. No, that's, that's not true. Integrity can be guaranteed in ways that aren't trustless. The only thing that blockchain adds is the ability to maintain integrity with the absence of trust. Integrity can be gotten in other ways. Okay, I, mean, I think maybe this is a, a, a question that we have a lot of debate around. Um, should I be handling somebody else's questions? Um, yeah, I just report, there's a question from Andreas that Stasi, who yep. is our next speaker. Uh, if I would just read this up, um, hi Ron, thanks for the great presentation. I'm glad to see that you taking into account the various complex challenges they pose, linked in such an effective way, the controversial issues of smart contracts with practical users that show how they can become, in fact, very useful legal contracts. Um, Andrew, do you, do you want to kind of, it's just basically a comment or is there a question here? No, it's a, it's a, just thanking Ron for the, for the super interesting <laughs> and practical presentation. I see that's a super controversial issues. There are many colleagues uh, thinking that uh, smart contracts are not legal contracts. And uh, I think that uh, Ron use case uh, helps uh, in, uh, in linking possibly, possibly if uh, they do have the, the, all the characteristics provided by law through a complex works that to, through a complex work that should be uh, joined by uh, by uh, uh, I mean uh, IT professionals and uh, uh, lawyers um, uh, and in that perspective uh, smart contracts I think as well that can become uh, smart legal contracts and can be uh, useful and enforceable uh, from the legal point of view, but it's not my presentation. So just to to, to appreciate the uh, Ron's uh, work and presentation here, and uh, I work on that in other uh, in other issues that I mentioned in the in the chat. Uh, thanks a lot, Ron. Okay, thanks for follow up. Yeah. So, so thank you so much uh, for the, uh, for such a great uh, technical uh, uh, presentation. As a former software engineer, I can definitely appreciate the the you know such a you know such a uh, depth of uh, of the linking between the architecture and then the legal problem. Uh, so there was one uh, thing, uh, one problem that you mentioned uh, um, uh, that said who can read both code and then the legal documents such as safe. Yeah. <laughs> There are very, there is very rare expertise uh, in the world around that. Uh, so maybe a solution could be uh, centered around the, I would say, re uh, uh, realities of uh, how investors perceive safe. So safe originated in, uh, from what I understand, in a Silicon Valley from Y Combinator, where the flow of deals, um, you know, companies being successful or failing is very fast. Right? So the velocity is very fast. Um, however, in Europe, uh, quite sophisticated investors, um, you know, angel investors, we don't understand safes. Just uh, I can tell from our own experience trying to sell some. Um, uh, and uh, essentially, what they, what they, you know, they, you know, they exactly are afraid of uh, exactly the same prob you know, uh, problems that you identified, which is dilution. And I think it's not fair to them because they are taking mm -hmm. much more risk than the VCs that will come later. And uh, Essentially, in reality, what they are asking ones, you know, the prudent, uh, you know, Buffett style value investors, they want some collateral. They want to put in some money, but they want some collateral. And essentially what, uh, you know, when, when you have a startup, so startup either can have attraction with users, so either users, or it can, can have IP. So my suggestion may be potential suggestion to 
solving that problem of you know having a lawyer that can read code or a software person can that read code is to introduce another piece a different change the architecture of a solution which would be instead of uh, um, kind of uh, you know introducing a new product such as for example ip uh, some ip item let's say patent or trademark or something like that or website or something like that so they you know so what we saw from those angel investors is that they um uh looking for some collateral and the idea there is that you if we can link the smart contract inputs for example money is paid etc cetera, etc cetera, to ip that could be linked to let's say nft mm -hmm. uh, that the investor could uh, could uh, could uh, could uh, own in his digital wallet that means that we can simulate that you know multiple we can actually run the model multiple times see how it performs under different you know kind of companies and that could be palatable also um, you know for real world investors so that's just a comment uh -huh. okay so thanks it's, I mean, it's interesting comments but yeah i mean it's uh, i mean we're still we're still sort of thinking through sort of where do we take this piece of work was it just sort of exercise as input into our, our, our sort of programming language interests or uh, do we sort of uh, try to make something of this? Is there a direction here, perhaps, of sort of uh, creating a sort of product which is sort of well analyzed and, and structured way of spinning up a safe smart contract with legal protections around it? So that's, uh, we're still thinking and, through that. Uh, and then, in just in terms of a kind of company accounting, kind of a, either balance sheet, uh, you, so you mentioned either the balance sheet or whether it's, uh, let's say, a liability, uh, you know, liability, where, where it goes into the, you know, the cap table or, the, or, or, or in the kind of liabilities. Um, there is maybe potentially a, yet another architecture for, for this. So right now, you know, the, the whole <laughs> craze in the, in, the, in the blockchain is about pegging the, some sort of a crypto, currency or something like that to a real asset such as a dollar dollar or some other you know uh, etc so uh, have you considered the other architecture that would allow uh, um, alternative architecture that would allow to for a company basically issue shares keep them on a balance sheet and then peg them to some sort of uh, instrument that could be traded openly and then uh, at the end of a month or every quarter or something like that, then they would see how many, um, you know, packed instruments were traded, and then they would transfer that into the share register. Okay. Uh, no, no, so they haven't considered those sorts of complexities. So one last response. Yes. Sorry, yeah, yeah, right. Quick response, and we have to go to keep Andrew waiting. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so our response is that. I mean, that's 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 very interesting. We haven't uh, gone in that direction as yet, no. Uh, 